Welcome to another lesson in open science, as we call them. This is also supposed to be an addition to the course on pre-registration and registered reports in order to include anyone who's familiar with the English, but not the German language. So for today, I'd like you to consider registered reports as a special case of pre-registration. So most of the content that I will be talking about applies to both, but I will uh, quickly outline the special features of registered reports later on as well. This is what I'd like to cover today. So there's quite a lot and I will get us started on current issues and problems that we face in science. I will then go ahead and define what pre-registration actually means, what its benefits are and how it's being adopted. I will then guide you through the process of pre-registrations and mention different methods and then try and address the more common obstacles and concerns with regards to pre-registration. So let's get us started on the problems and issues we face in science. And the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that there is a certain subject of mistrust towards scientific findings. And this is true among researchers as well as laypersons. So I'm not talking about conspiracy theorists or any ludicrous ideas. Also not questioning the system that science operates in in general. But if we, for example, look at this kind of sur survey where actually nature asked scientists if they thought there was a reproducibility crisis more than well the large majority of scientists actually do think there is some sort of this kind of crisis and if scientific findings are not reproducible that obviously heavily questions their validity so some something doesn't appear to be quite right and there's actually some data to back that up for example if we look at the average statistical power of findings in the life sciences, we see that that power is very low and it doesn't correspond to the published rate of positive findings, which is actually well above 90% at all. So something definitely is not quite right. And as researchers, we're obviously aware of that and researchers tend to strive for better, but this is sort of where we are at the moment. And to elaborate on that issue a little bit, I'd like to talk about the replication crisis in psychology. And not because this discipline has more problems and issues than others, but only because a group of scientists actually tried and collect some data on this idea. And what they tried and do was to replicate a hundred of the more relevant studies. And they actually found that the significant results when replicated decreased from 97 to 36%, so very much significantly. And um, we see that in all of these red dots where the uh, significant results were not reproduced and obviously the effect sizes weren't either. And the green ones where the replication also yielded significant results, the effect sizes obviously correlated well with the original ones. But this is obviously something that's that shows that even widely acknowledged research is not quite as robust as we think. And obviously a number of re reasons have been suggested. Part of that will be coincidence and error, but that should only account for about 5% as we know. So there are things like biases and questionable research practices that we need to be aware of. And by questionable research methods, I'm not I do not mean deceptive or fraudulent in any way. So these are processes that can happen very much implicitly and subconsciously. And I will come back to that in a minute. So let's look at a couple more famous of those potentially questionable research methods. One's called hacking, the other p-hacking. Hacking actually refers to hypothesizing after results are known. So we might look at our data and do not find the effect that we predicted. However, we do find some other significant 
effect and we can then go ahead and pretend that that's what we've been looking for all along and that's why this cartoon of the texas sharpshooter is quite illustrative p-hacking actually refers to analyzing your data over and over again using some slightly different methods so you could look at a different transformation a different statistical model or any other exclusion criteria of, of your outliers and you just keep doing that until you stumble upon some significant results and that's what you are going to end up publishing any researcher actually knows that there are very clear incentives and advantages to finding positive and exciting effects and that will be much easier to publish and again even though scientists do not try and deceive and cheat but you subconsciously and implicitly just want to find significant results and that already has an effect as we will see Another thing that we look at, need to look at is the file drawer issue. And what that means is that the likelihood of a result being published depends on the results itself. So if we look at, at this just theoretical normal distribution of scientific findings, we see that apparently only the extreme ones are being published. So what you need to ask yourself is what if for every effect that we find in the literature there are actually multiple other studies showing none at all but we never heard about them because they simply weren't published in the first place so that means only the those positive findings the interesting and exciting effects find their way into the literature and that sort of distorts the the body of literature and the reality that we assume eventually So to summarize, Brian Neusser came up with the path to incredibility, uh, drawing up the process towards a scientific publication. And he says that we conduct our study, and once we've done that and analyzed our data, we can ask ourselves if we found what we predicted. And if we did, that's great, we can publish that. However, in most cases, as we know, we don't find exactly what we predicted or something else as well. And if we do not find those effects, we can ask ourselves if there's any other interesting effects or any other variables that we found, do they reveal significant results? And we do some harking, and if we were able to find one such variable, we can publish that, and that's already not as great, and we will see why in a minute. If we were unable to find any significant results among the variables that we recorded, we can simply keep on analyzing and analyzing, do some p-hacking and look for any other uh, analysis that will yield significant effects. And if we do find something like that, we will publish it and that's already, uh, that's also not great. If we are completely unable to find something that is significant, any, any significant effects at all, Scientists usually give up on their study, put in the file drawer, and no one will ever know about it and keep on studying the same thing over and over again. That's obviously also not great. And usually researchers are quite familiar with this kind of practice and know it's not right, but they're sort of you're sort of stuck with the system, and that's where, where we're at at the moment. Another great illustration of these problems is the multiverse. And if you think about the analyses that you conduct on data sets, you will know that there is actually a number of decisions that you have to make, like consider what outliers to exclude, or other exclusion criteria, you have to think about transformations and statistical models. And even a few of those decisions uh, lead to a vast number of different combinations, which will each yield a slightly different result in terms of a ZOP value. And those results actually differ much more than we used to think and anticipate. So if you consider a null effect, these combinations can actually yield opposing results and very different ones depending on 
where where you find yourself in in the scope of this multiverse. If the decisions throughout your analyses are made in sort of a stepwise fashion, you can actually observe the effects of each of those decisions on your outcome. And although each of those decisions in itself might be completely justifiable, you're able to produce a trend towards the more extreme and, and rare results within the scope of the multiverse. So if there are clear incentives towards finding positive extreme results, actually, subconsciously or not, there are ways to make it happen. And what it comes down to is the difference between prediction and what we might call postdiction. And obviously prediction cannot be influenced by our data collection or analyses, and that is very important, but postdiction can. And actually the p-values that we receive from our standard null hypothesis significance testing are only applicable in the context of prediction and much less interpretable in the context of postdiction. And the difference between the two is actually the same as the difference between confirmatory and exploratory analyses. So we have to note that both are very much valuable to the scientific community, but we definitely have to be able to distinguish between the two concepts and we have to be able to judge accordingly. So this is what a lot of researchers actually think that we're stuck with. And let's look at how pre-registration might help in, in counteracting these problems that are outlined. So let's quickly look at how what pre-registration is and how it works. So pre-registration is actually simply an a priori documentation of what you're planning to do in your study. I will come back to the content, but this is sort of what is usually included. You will then submit your documents to an independent party, something like the Open Science Framework. Again, there are other methods that I will come back to. And I would already like to mention at this point that there is usually a way to embargo your submission so other people cannot see what you're planning to do straight away and steal your ideas or something like that in, in case you are afraid of that. You will also receive a timestamp and those submissions are immutable to some degree. That doesn't mean you cannot change or delete anything at all, but there will always be a record of a record of what happened to those documents so you can compare your eventual publication with what you planned in the first place. There are a few key principles that you need to be aware of in the context of pre-registration. And the first thing is that what you're looking for is once you've come up with your study idea, so it's something that you want to investigate, you want to decrease the degrees of freedom of the researchers as much as possible. And that obviously means that you try and make those decisions in advance and carefully plan what you're going to do throughout the study. Generally, you want to be as transparent as possible. And this is also true in case you need to change something or you want to talk about or you want to explore your data. Both of those things are completely fine and, and any changes that might occur might be completely justifiable and still allow for confirmatory analyses. However, you need to be transparent about that. Generally, you want to regard pre-registration as a tool for sincere scientists who simply want to try and improve the quality of their research by reducing implicit bias. So to summarize the mechanisms by which pre-registration actually might improve the current system, let me 
introduce you to the path to credibility in this case. And what you do is you plan and obviously pre-register your study. And you try and conduct your data collection and your study and as well as analyze your data according to that plan. You can then ask yourself if you were able to stick to that plan. And if you were, that's great. You simply publish your results, no matter what they are, even if they were null effects. And we have to be a little bit careful with regard to the file drawer because still, if the system allows for more significant, for significance results to be published more easily, pre-registration won't change that. However, there are some mechanisms which might improve this. And especially in the case of registered reports, we can count and counteract the file drawer effectively. And I will come back to that later on. If you weren't able to stick to that plan, that's fine. That's That happens quite a lot. However, if the changes that you made were justified and in many cases, they still allow for confirmatory results, you can simply be transparent about it and, and publish them as what they are. If they might, if they not, if they don't, so if, if you're unable to come up with confirmatory analyses, or if you simply want to explore your data a little bit more, that's also fine. You simply label that accordingly and you use more descriptive ways of analyzing your data. You provide the justification you have for what you did and you are transparent about everything and you simply publish that as well. And as I said, that is also very valuable to the scientific community. So this is sort of what the system might look like instead. Pre-registration also works in the context of this multiverse idea. If you remember, each of those different results in the scope of this multiverse reflects a combination of different decisions that were made mainly throughout the data analysis. So pre-registration forces us to make those decisions in advance, and that actually ensures that we end up with an arbitrary result within the scope of this multiverse. And what that does is it gives us enough confidence that we end up with a true effect because statistically we have the vast majority of results reflecting the true effect. And therefore we avoid the trend that might be produced if, if we're able to make those decisions as we conduct the analyses and are able to observe the effects on the data as we saw earlier. So in theory, pre-registration works very well. However, it's not as trivial to estimate uh, the effectiveness of pre-registration in reality. What we can do is look at the introduction of mandatory pre-registration of clinical trials in the US. And what we find is that the rate of positive results actually dropped from 57 to 8%, which is sort of similar to what we found earlier in the um, replication crisis in psychology. So this in itself is obviously indicative of the issues and problems that I alluded to earlier. And again, the, the increased amount of null effects or even harmful effects was obviously true before the introduction of mandatory pre-registration. However, those studies um, or those effects weren't published or it was, or, fo or researchers focused on the, on the positive effects. In another study, the researchers actually compared epidemiological studies in cancer research, so another longitudinal approach. And what they found was that the, the strongest factor associated with actual true pros positive results was a specific a priori, priori hypothesis, and that's obviously something that we can enforce through through pre-registration. In another study, Soderberg et al. looked 
at the quality of registered reports. So I will come back to registered reports, but they're sort of like the gold standard of pre-registration. And in this study, experienced reviewers were given scientific articles. And registered reports actually outperformed any other non-registered studies with regards to any of their quality uh, quality criteria. And that was something like importance, alignment, or rigor and such. So even the data that we have sort of indicates that pre-registration is quite effective in, in counteracting the issues and problems that I mentioned earlier. However, pre-registration is not only beneficial to the greater good, so to speak, but also on sort of an, an individual level. And by that, I mean on the level of the research group. However, I would like to include the aspects of the reduction of implicit bias, as well as the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory investigations, because both of those things actually improve the quality of research. And this is also obviously something that research groups strive for and, and is a true benefit on this level as well. Additionally, what researchers tend to favor is an increased focus on project management. So careful planning and actually investing more resources in that stage of a research project. And also modern research projects tend to be collaboration with other groups and pre-registration is actually a great way to initialize those collaborations and, and come up with a pre-registration as a team. And finally, there are things like open science badges, which are obviously good for your reputation. So journals are actually able to, uh, actually able to award those badges and they, they represent sort of a quality seal for your work. Additionally, there are um, benefits on a personal level as well. So these seven selfish reasons for pre-registrations have been published and they claim that sort of you, you can take credit for your predictions. It's good for your reputation. Um, it's more exciting to actually pre-register and especially in the case of registered reports, which I will come back to later on, you're also not as much prone to being taken hostage by your data. So you can, um, you, you don't have to worry about publishing your data, even though they're null, null effects. And you're also able to protect yourself from postdoc critique and, and things like that. As always, some of those arguments may seem more convincing to you than others. But the most important thing is that in the vast majority of cases, Researchers don't really give up on pre-registration once they've, they've tried it. And that's sort of the most convincing argument. The benefits of pre-registrations are also reflected in the data looking at the adoption of pre-registration. For example, Christensen et al. did a survey on open science practice in general. And they actually found that in recent years, pre-registrations have started to increase. And the same can be seen when looking at online platforms like the Open Science Framework or as predicted as well. Uh, and the numbers of pre-registrations have increased rapidly and continue to do so. So even when, when looking at these numbers today, there is actually more than 82,000 registrations on the Open Science Framework and numbers are still increasing. So generally we can see that the benefits of pre-registrations appear to be very relevant to the scientific community and therefore numbers appear to be increasing quickly. However, what we do see is that the adoption of pre-registration is not uniform across all disciplines. And for example, in this case, the amount of researchers who would consider pre-registration is growing faster in the, in the field of psychology. And so they appear to represent sort of the pioneers of pre-registration. 
At the same time, if we look at the number of uh, pre-registration as a fraction of the total number of papers that are being published, we see that only a very small fraction of those studies actually was pre-registered. So there's, there's a long way to go still, but again, numbers are increasing. So let's look at how pre-registration actually works and what the different methods are and also get a closer look at registered reports. There is no globally acknowledged standard for pre-registrations. However, most contain something, as I said earlier, like um, metadata, any information on the study design, the sampling, so data collection and other methods, and also the analysis plan. Obviously, studies are largely heterogeneous and therefore different templates have been developed by experts. And templates in this case means something like a form which is supposed to sort of pose the right questions and in this way guide you through the process of pre-registrations. These templates differ with regards to their specificity. So for example, the as predicted template uh, uses only a few very open questions that can be answered very easily and, and fast. And then there is uh, templates that are actually specific to, let's say, fMRI research, which contain the, the questions that you wouldn't want answered in, in this area. Obviously, it is advisable to choose the template which is most suitable to your discipline, but also to the type of study. So if you're, for example, looking at uh, any, say, secondary data analysis, there will be a specific template that will help you with that. As long as you follow the basic principles, you can actually be creative about how to pre-register a study. You could say there's three different categories and we will come back to the pros and cons of each later on. But there's definitely online registries, which tend to be the most common ones, and um, you will receive your permanent identifier and your timestamp uh, with your document. But then there is also registered reports, which might rely on online registries, but I will explain in detail why, why they are special in a second. And then you can actually use any other type of publication as a pre-registration. So you could, for example, publish your study protocol in advance, or you could use a poster at a, at a conference to uh, pre-register your study. Let's focus on registered reports for a second. As I said, they might rely on online registries. However, the most important aspect about them is that they are a collaborative effort between authors and journals with responsibilities on both sides. And the process sort of starts off similar to what you're used to. You develop your idea, you design your study. So you come up with sort of everything of a standard paper up to the methods section. So including the methods section. And what you do is you will then submit that document to a journal which offers these registered reports and you submit it to a peer review process. And the important thing is that this peer review process is much more constructive than what you're used to because you can actually change something about what you're going to do. You don't have to simply defend against the criticism of reviewers. You can actually incorporate their, their suggestions. And if that's approved, you will receive an in principle acceptance status. And what that means is that the journal actually commits to publishing the outcome of your study, no matter what the results are. So once you've got that in principle acceptance status, you will collect your data, you will write your report as you're used to. And then there is another review. However, this review is much more formal. It just checks whether you did what you said you were going to do. And if any changes, as I said earlier, there might be changes. If those changes are justified, 
So it's just a formal process of checking whether you generally adhere to good practice. And as I said, the journal will eventually publish your report, no matter if you're just saying there's there's no effect in, in what I looked at. And more and more journals actually offer this type of publication. And the Center for Open Science maintains a, a list on their website of these journals. Let's look at the pros and cons of each of those approaches. Online registries are the most widely used one, and that's probably because they're a very easy and fast way of pre-registering your study. And that's why they also allow for a stepwise approach. And what I mean by that is that you can actually register up to a certain point. And before you continue with your analyses, um, you just register what you're going to do next when you're at that point. And that might come in very handy if you're only getting started on pre-registrations and don't really know how to go about it. The major disadvantage with online registries is that in many cases, there's no quality assurance at all. So anyone can un upload anything to these registries and it's getting harder and harder to discern between good and bad registrations. And bad registrations are actually, in many cases, no better than no registration at all. Registered reports, as I said, are the gold standards. So they have been referred to as the as pre-registration on steroids or the Rolls-Royce of pre-registration. And that's probably because they are actually able to effectively counteract the file drawer that I mentioned earlier. Obviously, this in principle acceptance status is also very attractive to researchers and the constructive nature of the review process is something that's also appreciated a lot. However, they are a little bit less predictable and take up more time and, research, uh, and, and resources and that's not something that researchers have a lot of. And that's the major disadvantage with uh, registered reports. Then any other publication is obviously an additional publication in itself, and that's an advantage to most researchers. However, those publications often have other goals and therefore, for example, focus on the dissemination of methods and are not actually designed to pre-register a study and therefore maybe not the ideal way of doing it. So let's finally address some of the more common obstacles and concerns that have been voiced with regards to pre-registrations. The first objection is that pre-registering a study requires too much extra work and scientists would have to spend resources they simply don't have. However, to that, you could say that this work would have to be done at some point anyways. You're just giving yourself a head start and can regard that as an investment. We'll also reduce the work that you spend on analyzing your data over and over again until you have found that perfect result, simply because you've decided on your analysis in advance. Some will claim that pre-registration is restrictive and science needs freedom, so we can't do it. However, you are obviously still free and actually encouraged to explore your data. All you have to do is label your analyses accordingly and not pretend that they are of confirmatory nature. Some will say that it's not going to stop fraud anyways, and that's simply not an argument at all. It will actually make fraud a little bit harder and will make it definitely more explicit. However, you should simply consider pre-registration as a tool for scientists who are sincerely trying to improve the quality of their research. Similar to randomization, that's not going to stop fraud, but we do it anyways because it makes our findings more credible. And then something that I've mentioned earlier is that a few people think that someone's going to steal 
their research idea once they've pre-registered their study. And with the option option to embargo, that's simply not the case and no one can steal your ideas. So this is everything content-wise. Thank you very much for making it this far. Please do feel free to browse through the course and look at all of the other resources that are linked within the pages. Also feel free to use the contact form in case you have any suggestions or questions. So thanks again and good luck with your next research project.